Hello, hello. Um, thank you again for joining us for From Apps to Automation, a marketing operations journey to automation. Uh, today with your host, my name is Lenny Eskin. Hi, um, I'm here from Trey. I'm head of demand generation here at Trey. I'm joined by our wonderful experts um, on the marketing ops side and our folks from SaaSend. Uh, before we get to the formal intros, <clears throat> I'd like to walk us through a brief agenda. All right, so today's agenda will be quite light. Um, we're really only covering a few things and, and the core of the content will be the fireside chat um, with the talented folks we have here on the line. Um, but uh, before that, there's just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first up, uh, if you have any questions during today's conversation, we'd love to uh, keep this conversation as interactive as possible. So please drop those in chat. Um, and then second, uh, for those who have attended these webinars before, not to worry, we send a recording um, to you about 24 hours after the webinar, uh, just for folks to uh, have a copy of your own. Um, all right, uh, and with that, um, I'll begin today's content uh, with, the, with the agenda. So first up, we have a quick speaker intro. We'll just cover uh, the folks you see here. Second, we'll cover a few common marketing ops uh, challenges and opportunities um, and ways that we've seen uh, folks utilize Trey in case you're unfamiliar with, with our company. Um, we'll then move into the fireside chat portion and of course, Q&A. So that's, that's where we get started with today. All right. Next slide, please. All right, so speakers, I'd like to uh, kick off the presentation with Lauren Robeck. She's our senior manager here at Mar of marketing operations here at Trey. Lauren, you care to say a few words about your background? Sure, thanks Lenny. Um, so I've been at Trey for about three years um, and my marketing operations journey began about seven years ago. Um, I currently co-lead the San Francisco Marketo user group um, with Amy Goldfein. Um, and I've been a Marketo user, I think at four companies now um, and a Trey user just at Trey. Um, so yeah, that's me. Awesome, we are delighted to have you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, Michelle, you're up next, marketing ops specialist here at Trey. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michelle Gramerson. Um, uh, today is actually my two year Trey anniversary. I came into Trey uh, two years ago as an intern um, while I was in school on uh, summer of 2019, um, continued to contract uh, throughout my senior year of college um, and now work full time at Trey um, where I build and maintain and troubleshoot a lot of our workflows and uh, spend a lot of my time in the product. So looking forward to talking with you all today. Awesome. And finally, um, we have Steven Stouffer, VP of Marketing Ops uh, over there at SaaSend. Uh, Steven's a big trade champion, and we are very grateful to have you on the call to chat uh, Marketing Ops today. Steven? Yeah, no, good to be here. Yeah, so I've been in the marketing automation, marketing ops space for about 10 years. Um, like you mentioned, I'm the VP of Marketing Ops at SaaSend. I'm also the MoPros part at chairperson, so uh, marketing operations uh, professionals group, uh, as well as just recently a Salesforce marketing champion for uh, 2021. So I'm glad to be here and uh, I'm excited to, to dive into all the great stuff we have here to be covered. Good stuff. Um, well, thank you, Stephen. We'll actually um, talk a little bit more about uh, your company, Sasend. Um, Sander, if you want to move us along, we'll get to uh, a little bit of background on your company. Sure. Yeah. So um, we focus in uh, four key areas, strategy, systems, data, and people. So we're a full uh, rev ops shop, marketing ops, sales ops. Uh, we work with go-to market teams to uh, build out the strategy, learn about you, learn about uh, the goals that the companies have. We work with the different systems. So we're very agnostic when it comes to the different systems that we use. Salesforce is typically always involved and Trey might be involved, Marketo, HubSpot, Pardot. Um, so we have a full CRM team and uh, marketing automation team. And we work with data, making sure that uh, your, your structure of your data is accessible and digestible for the uh, businesses. And then we also work with people. So uh, making sure that teams are properly trained and the resources are there to onboard uh, new new people. So 
Um, we see things all the way from Salesforce customizations, reporting dashboard, multi-touch attribution, um, as well as managed services. So we, we cover the full scope of RevOps and uh, work with a lot of go-to-market teams uh, from companies across the board. Awesome. Um, well, we'll touch on a lot of those topics uh, during the conversation today. Um, so thank you, Stephen, for the, the brief intro and to send. Um, before we get to some of the fireside chat portion of the conversation, we wanted to prime the conversation with a couple of just brief slides on um, a little bit of what Trey does, as well as sort of what we see in the market as um, some common challenges and opportunities, frankly, for uh, marketing ops organizations. So um, I'd like to talk first briefly, because we, we actually speak with companies at Outreach, uh, like Gong, Notion, uh, Udemy, Demandbase, all of these companies that utilize us uh, here at Trey for um, marketing ops use cases. And uh, as part of those conversations, we've seen some common threads. Um, and I'd like to just point out a few of them here. Um, and again, we'll get into this in more depth during the fireside chat, but I thought it was uh, a helpful context sharing. So what we've seen in, really in the market um, and what some of the problems that we're trying to address here at Trey is ever expanding software tech stacks uh, that really burden marketing ops teams um, with all sorts of different types of technology. Call it uh, your event marketing technology, your email marketing, your um, full demand gen stack, your automation technology like Marketos and Pardots of the world, whatever you might be using. And ultimately what this does, or what we've seen it do is, is create some fragmentation amongst the stack for teams. Um, we've seen upwards of 55 plus different apps within the marketing technology stack and actually upwards of hundred plus um, for go-to-market teams. So this challenge um, is one that we uh, wanna be able to help folks uh, tackle. Um, and of course, I think a lot of marketing ops folks wanna be able to tackle. So the second part of that is a lot of uh, manual process. And uh, ultimately what we see is something like 60% of folks spending three plus hours of their week manually moving data between tools. That's um, you know everything from Google Sheets um, to manual entry, lead upload, um, maybe perhaps even challenges around lead routing. That's something that I think is a pretty common um, issue in the MOPS space and one I've dealt with at every company I've been in the past. Um, and of course, things like handling order workflows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's just a lot of manual stuff that folks do in their day-to-days that we want to be able to uh, work through and cut down ultimately to, to enable teams to do more strategic work. Uh, and finally, the third portion is rigid process. And, and we've, we've seen this um, really around ultimately what the primary function of a lot of operations teams is. It's really around driving uh, effective process. Um, so we want, we want to help improve those processes to actually grow revenue. Um, but unfortunately, if those, re those processes actually help folks or keep folks from being able to move quickly, it means they get stuck. And ultimately, it means a lot of those, um, those improvements that you'd like to create um, are, are actually a little bit further away than they're able to tackle uh, on their own. So Trey is one of those tools that helps enable that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. There's lots out, out there, and we'll talk about some of those other tools as well. All right. Um, next slide, please. All right, so of course you can't just throw problem uh, people at this problem, um, especially now because I don't think uh, most like most of you, you're probably not stacked with like five to ten um, marketing ops folks on your teams. We we have two um, here at Trey, and they pretty much do everything um, and help us scale our business. So for for us, we think about this as breaking through from a uh, with a different mindset, and some of this is kind of thinking about your application stack your kind of end-to-end -end process, um, not adding necessarily new point solutions um, to the, to the, uh, the game, uh, which is already a pretty complicated uh, subset of 55 plus, like we mentioned, um, different applications. But actually finding out ways to connect these stack applications so that you can better run the process, take control of your tech stack, um, and use automation to optimize operations for your business. So um, let's, let's actually talk a little bit about what that looks like um, in the next slide. So this will be our fireside chat portion of the conversation. And I'd love to give you, start us off. Um, maybe perhaps Stephen, you can, you can speak to this. The first question that we wanted to kind of broach um, for the audience is uh, around your first automation. What did you use uh, for the very first time? What did you do in your journey? 
Yeah. So um, Envision, uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, Stephen in college, uh, I, I started as an intern at a university uh, as a front end developer and an analyst. Um, so what does a front end developer and analyst have anything to do with automation? Well, nothing. Uh, my, my, my manager actually left the company six months into my 18 month internship. Um, the, the university was like, well, the only person essentially left the company using, you know, Zapier, Pardot, Salesforce. And they're like, well, you've got six months experience. You're like the next best person to take this over. Uh, so very, uh, I went kicking and screaming and I'm like, all right, fine. I'll just tackle this. I got like another year of my, my internship. I'm going to make the best of it. I guess I'm going to do this thing called marketing ops, marketing automation. And uh, it's funny. I, I've told that story a few different times in, in I like kind of look around the room and other mops folks are like, yeah, like I also just like entered into the industry kicking and screaming, not wanting anything to do with it. Well, that was me. Uh, and then a couple months into that, I just fell in love with Pardot. I fell in love with automation, fell in love with marketing operations. Uh, and the rest is history. And I've been in, in it ever, ever since. So um, yeah, I had a bit of a rough start, uh, but I absolutely love the space. Um, I've been working with Pardot um, pretty much ever since. I've also been in Marketo and HubSpot and some other um, automation tools. And I've also used Zapier, like if this and that, um, of course, Trey, which I think we're gonna talk about in a little, a little bit later. But um, yeah, so that's kind of how I got introduced to the, the automation uh, uh, space and I've never looked back since. Awesome. Um, that is a great story. I love the kicking and screaming element of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Michelle, I don't believe you were kicking and screaming uh, mo moving into Trey, but um, I, we'd love to also hear a little bit of, of uh, your story and uh, what got you started on your first automation. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, my journey began at Trey and is still at Trey. Uh, I came in um, we were a much smaller startup then, and I had no idea what I'd be working on that summer. But what I did know is I was determined to learn the product um, and just kind of dive in. And um, not a lot of the marketing team at all was using Trey. Um, and I thought that this was a great opportunity to gain some more technical skills, um, kind of like kickstart my career. Um, and yeah, at the time it was just Lauren and I, and now we have five people um, started, on the growth team. You started as an intern too, right? Yeah, 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 I did. Okay, well, our, our two internships started out very differently. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of uh, the beginning uh, workflows that we worked on were campaign uh, support related um, and specifically webinars. Um, just like the one we're on today, a lot of um, workflows we have go into the pre and post webinar, um, automating registrations, automating attendee um, uh, communications afterwards. Um, so yeah, that's how I got started uh, with automation. The, G the DG team here is very grateful for you both, um, <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> yeah, um, so funny enough, my, my first real job out of college was also in higher ed, um, similar to Steven. And uh, my initial role was as a, as a temp. Um, and I was doing manual data entry of, so it was a, it was a university, and it had a sales team to try to get new students in the door. And so I was doing manual data entry of basically the call sheets of the sales team because they had ripped out their CRM and were working on buying and implementing a new one. Um, so that was, I, I wasn't going to talk about that because I, I ended up like implementing that new CRM. So it was CRM, not like marketing automation, but sort of a similar story of like experiencing the, and you know, this is like early mid aughts. Um, so quite a while ago and just the experience of literally like hand keying phone calls and emails to prospects into Excel and then migrating from Excel into a CRM. Um, so that was like the very, very beginning of my career. The more, um, you know, squarely in the marketing ops world. Uh, I started out in Pardot and Marketo. And so my understanding of automation was using those tools. Um, and my understanding now is totally different now that I've been using Trey for a few years. Um, so I, I definitely, like one big difference for me is just the mindset, like in my previous roles where 
myself and other marketing ops folks were mostly just like Marketo users, we all had this mindset that, um, you know, Marketo can only do so much. Like, oh yeah, we can do that in Marketo, but it's gonna require like daisy training smart campaigns on smart campaigns. And it's, you know, gonna have some, like some negative side effects and that kind of thing. Um, so that was sort of like where my mindset was um, before joining Trey, I would say. I think that's a perfect transition to our next question. Thank you, Lauren, um, for sharing. By the way, I was also higher ed. I think we also, for some oh, reason, funny. share that common thread. Oh, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I can attest to some of the challenges uh, on the operations side there in, in higher ed, yeah. um, being in marketing there. Um, so anyway, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, when you first started using automation. What was that like aha moment like for you, Lauren? Uh, maybe we can start with you since sure. kind of piggybacks off of the last answer. Yeah. Um, so when I joined Trey, we were doing lead routing in Marketo and um, the, I guess like the, there was one piece of automation that was happening in Trey that I can remember and that was lead to account matching. Um, but lead routing was happening in Marketo. So there were a lot of issues, like there were some things that we did in Trey, um, but then Marketo was still driving like the majority of our lead management processes. So there were some issues with timing um, and duplicates and also just like the fact that we had a team that was beginning to grow. We no longer had like two SDRs. Now we had five and they were divided up into different pods. Um, and so we had a lot of race condition issues with getting leads assigned to the right place. Um, and I hadn't personally owned lead routing before in my previous roles. Um, other companies had used lean data, distribution engine, Salesforce queues. Uh, and so, you know, we hit this point where the sales team was starting to scale and we needed to do something more robust than running it in Marketo. Um, which I probably could have continued to do, but I just felt like this isn't like what Marketo is built for and not what I had used Marketo for in the past. So that coupled with the Trey ethos of using our own product since we have the opportunity to do so, um, that was really where I began. It was both modifying our lead to account routing, um, our lead to account match workflow, um, improving that existing workflow that I had inherited, as well as building out a whole new lead routing solution in Trey. Um, and today that has blossomed, I would say, into um, running our entire end-to-end -end lead management in Trey. Um, so yeah, that was, that was like the first kind of use case for me. So 20 plus SDRs and, and uh, another 20 plus AEs later. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're still doing the same thing, <laughs> but now in track. Well, it's um, very different. I can tell you it looks very different today than it did then. <laughs> We've learned a lot. <laughs> um, awesome. Um, well, I think that's a good uh, transition point um, for our next uh, section. Um, so I'd love to, to kick it off um, around how you evaluate uh, tools and, and talk a little bit about the tools journey. Um, so maybe Stephen, since uh, you guys at the agency side think about it a little bit differently, I'd love to get your, um, your take on this question. Like, what do you guys look for? Sure, sure. Yeah, before, before I do this, though, I was looking through the attendee list and I see Brandon Ashton, who was my manager, who abandoned me at my higher ed internship. Uh, but I owe him almost everything, honestly. He, he trained me super, super well to take over when, when he ended up leaving the company. But I wanted to give him a little shout out because I actually see he's attending here. <laughs> I think that's funny. Uh, as far as the application side, um, I, the first thing I do as a, as a MOPS person is actually just map out the ecosystem. So like I, I map out all the technology that we currently use, figure out where the data silos are. Um, I identify the areas where you're trying to fit in a tool. I mean, one of the worst things you can do is purchase a tool for just one very niche use case, but then it's not flexible to, you know, plug into your entire ecosystem. So I see time and time again, the clients, at least I work with, sometimes they, they get one tool for one thing and then they have another use case pop up and then it just, it can't handle that. 
So the first thing I do is I get something like a Miro or some sort of uh, mind mapping tool, map out. Typically it starts with your CRM as like your core hub or whatever your core hub is. Map out all the tools that are connected to it or the tools that are not connected to it that you wanna connect to it. And then start evaluating um, you know, automation system tools and where they can plug the gaps. Um, I, I kind of start there. I think it's also important to pull in other departments um, and pull in other use cases because oftentimes an automation tool may start with marketing or marketing operations or RevOps or the go-to-market team, but then you have accounting and you have HR uh, and all these other departments within the business that in a lot of cases have also use cases to leverage these tools. So I think it's important to meet kind of with those stakeholders um, identify what those use cases are and then bring them to whatever the tool is. And then um, you can either do a bake off. I, I've done bake offs, like 30 day trials with different tools, like an if this and that versus Zapier versus Trey or, um, you know, whatever. Also, if you just gonna get on the, the, a call with like a solution engineer or a salesperson from these tools, you can tell pretty quickly once you start bringing up your, your tech stack, whether or not it's gonna, gonna be a good fit. So that's kind of where it starts, kind of how I think about it. Um, thanks, Stephen. I think uh, some of those ideas are really helpful uh, for folks. Maybe they can duplicate some of those things. Um, Lauren, I'm I'm curious your perspective on this because you do this at Trey. Um, so, and uh, a lot of the tools that we want to use on the DG team go through Lauren. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious what what's your take on it? Yeah, two other things that I would add in addition to things that Stephen shared already. Um, one, because we are Trey, we often think about, can we build this ourselves first? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give, th there's examples where we decide to build it ourselves, um, like multi-touch attribution, for example. We've, I've run a couple over the almost three years, I've run a couple evaluations of MTA at different times and looked at buying a tool. And we always come back to building it ourselves. Um, we just feel like we have the, the capabilities and the resources. Um, and that gives us, like using Trey gives us the flexibility to really build a solution that meets the business needs. Um, you know, alternatively, like we thought about, could we build a meeting scheduler, a meeting booker ourselves? And we could have, um, but it was easier and cheaper um, to buy a tool. So we used Chili Piper. Um, we, you know, we could have used our growth engineering resources for that, but they, they typically have like bigger impact projects that are gonna um, you know, have a real impact on the top of our funnel. So that's more worth their time than um, building that kind of a tool ourselves. So just a couple examples there. And then the other thing that we typically care about is does the vendor, the vendors that we're looking at, do they have a good API? And um, we often end up wanting to build workflows using their API because it gives us more flexibility and we can solve some problems that maybe the, the vendor can't do themselves. Um, or we can connect tools that the vendor doesn't have out of the box integrations with. Um, and I would say there's a caveat, like sometimes it's better to just use the native integrations that a vendor offers. Um, I've, we, for Michelle and I went down a road for over six months using the API of this one vendor and no other customer uses their API and it sucked. And it was a huge headache. And now we just use their native Salesforce integration and it's beautiful. <laughs> so that's that's another factor to look at. And it's not for us, it's not like API or die, um, you know, especially given that experience we had. Sometimes the easiest solution is the best solution. Um, well, we have a quick poll for folks um, that we'd love your take on. Um, you might be able to see it come up now. Um, what are some of the common considerations that you guys uh, out there use when considering uh, tools? We'd love to hear from you. All right, um, while, while we're taking that poll, we'll have results come up. Um, I'd love to uh, chat a little bit more about um, uh, folks' common problems and solutions um, that you see automation. 
uh, solving. I know that we'll talk specifically about marketing ops here. Um, that's the theme of the webinar. But um, of course, there's a lot of use cases that folks can find outside that maybe even like Stephen uh, shared with you at the beginning of the call. Um, we can, of course, touch on those uh, during Q&A if you're interested. So um, with that, I'd love to um, have Stephen, what's your, what's your take on, on uh, common pain points of, and solutions that you guys are challenged with? Yeah, yeah. So w one thing that Lauren actually said earlier, which, which resonated uh, with, with me was around Marketo and uh, smart campaigns and how you're like nesting smart campaigns within smart campaigns. Uh, I, I have had similar situations where Pardot or really just any any tool where out of the box functionality just doesn't allow you to do something. Something as simple as just copying a value over to a, uh, from one field to another, you would think is simple, um, but but really it's 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 pretty complex, and and some tools don't actually allow you to do that. Um, but as far as other uh, interesting use cases, I saw automation just drastically impact uh, impact just um, content syndication through third parties. So um, at, in past lives and, and clients we work with, they they either will have content on someone else's website or um, s somewhere outside the domain that they control. Um, and then what happens is. Um, someone else's form gets submitted and then a CSV um, import gets created, let's say on a Monday or a Friday, and then they send that to back to the initial um, partner. And then it needs to get imported. Some, you know, a data modification needs to happen in order to fit into, you know, system B. Um, and then it needs to be routed to sales and there needs to be follow-up. So uh, one place I saw automation just drastically impact was that process took about a week and a half, maybe even two weeks. Uh, when we layered on automation and just um, provided the, the partner with a webhook that they could just post data to, um, I'm now getting data in real time. So I'm no longer having to deal with CSV imports and exports, data modification. They can just post data to the webhook in whatever format makes sense for them. We can then change the format, rework it to um, fit the needs of just about any system, and then plug it into um, our Salesforce instance or market automation instance as just business as usual. And we can cut down the lead time from let's say a week and a half uh, two weeks on the on the long side, all the way down to like one second from post from uh, third party to getting it within Salesforce. So when when you think about just the impact of a business of taking something that could take days or weeks um, to getting to sales in seconds, um, I mean we all know leads die and they get cold quick. So um, that was a pretty big business impact that that I experienced uh, specifically using Trey. Um, and allowing the velocity from uh, prospect to um, MQL to getting to sales uh, was very, very impactful and it made a really big difference in the business. Yeah, yeah. I've seen similar things on, on the uh, demand gen side. When you're able to cut down your um, lead response times, it really yep. helps um, in, in improve conversion rates down the funnel, but also just the prospect experience, which I think is really the core of what we all think about um, in marketing land. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Michelle, what, what's your take on that? I know you've used um, uh, similar types of processes uh, for multiple different manual, different uploads that we use. Are there any other use cases that you found um, unique, worth sharing uh, here at Trey? Yeah, um, yeah, I was gonna touch on earlier, kind of, um like for the uh, aha moment question, um, when um, I was first starting out um, and we started sending uh, customized emails that were triggered um, when an um, initial meeting with a um, sales uh, member was booked. Um, and then that was um, gonna, in the email, we like prompted the prospects with some questions and we also um, send it over a coffee gift card. Um, and so we were connecting you know, outreach Salesforce, um, and said, oh, so um, multiple different services. And it was um, one of the first kind of use cases that I got to work on. Um, and that was eliminating some manual work um, and giving back the AE some time in their day. Um, and then ultimately engaging the prospect before the meeting um, so they could um, have a smoother uh, transition once it started. Yeah, enri enriching the prospect experience with gifts, always a good idea as well. Um, uh, that We find that that's in improved our 
um, attendance rates for things like webinars. It's helped improve our meeting held rates, things like that. Um, so, so major shift for our business. Um, how about you, Lauren? Anything that you'd like to add use cases um, that you find automation uniquely powerful for? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, at a high level for me, there's like, there's ways that an automation platform can allow you to fill in gaps that your existing stack can't do on its own, um, namely integrations or other features and functionality. Um, and then there's eliminating manual work. Um, and, you know, so I think Stephen and, and Michelle have given examples that kind of speak to both of those. Um, one example that I had uh, is where an integration just doesn't exist. So we run a few different recurring webinars at Trey. We have a weekly product demo. We have a couple that are customer facing um, and the Zoom Marketo integration doesn't support recurring webinars. It only supports one-off webinars like this one. And so we have a Michelle built a really cool scalable set of workflows that Anytime we have a new recurring webinar, we can add that in um, and we run the registration, the attendance, no-show, follow-up processes through those workflows. Um, and I'm not really sure what the alternative would be other than probably some painful manual work. Um, so yeah, that's just a great example of like filling in where a, a tool or two tools don't have the integration you need. Yeah, and things like lead enrichment um, with Clearbit that we add on to each of those webinars, which is pretty incredible um, and and very valuable, I think, for the, the sales folks to have more more um, powerful conversations, um, at least more relevant. All right, so um, moving on, um, let's let's chat uh, a little bit more um, about kind of what we see in the future. Um, many companies we found are centralizing um, the operations. Uh, function into kind of revenue, revenue operations departments, uh, resulting in teams like uh, sales and marketing ops being less uh, siloed or focused. Um, does that charter make sense to you? I'd love to just get your uh, take on this. Um, are there cases when it doesn't? Uh, what What's your take on this, Stephen, given you probably have seen this uh, come up a few times? This will be the, the fire portion of our fireside chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh... I mean, I can see like marketing ops maybe funneling under rev ops or even like go to mark like a go to marketing team, um, for sure. I I think where the biggest controversy is whether or not marketing ops should actually be under sales ops or under sales leadership. Um, there's actually I'm actually right now on a LinkedIn kind of thread of people kind of battling it out of whether or not you know marketing should funnel under uh, or marketing ops should funnel actually under sales because. Um, at their core it's to, to support sales. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer for you on this. Um, I, I think that I'm seeing a transition um, as companies mature um, to be a little bit more unified and kind of break things out. So um, when you're a younger company, you might just have a marketing ops team that also takes care of sales force and reporting and, and you know all those kind of business needs. But then as you grow, um, and mature a little bit, I, I do see it being segmented out a little bit, right? So you may have a Salesforce operations team that owns Salesforce and Sendoso and Salesloft, um, you know, kind of all the sales tech and then marketing um, ops would own all the marketing tech and then rev ops would maybe be focused more about reporting and Tableau and integrations or Domo um, and have kind of a reporting team behind it. So I don't know if it's whether or not um, the, the industry is, is um, moving into any specific direction or rather it's around just the business maturity and where it's at in any given time. Um, so I, it's just something to think about. And I don't think there's any right or wrong answer there. It's just, I've found depending on the size of the business and even the type of the business, um, each it, it just seems to be structured, structured differently. Um, but I'm curious to see what everyone else thinks about this. Um, yeah, Lauren, uh, I'm curious, what, what's your perspective on this? I, I totally agree. Um, and I can speak to what it's been like at Trey for us. So when I joined, um, 
I was replacing the previous ops person who had left and it was ops of one. So I did Salesforce stuff. I learned new Salesforce things that I didn't know before um, as well as marketing ops. Um, and now we have a growth ops team and Michelle and I are like very squarely marketing ops focused within growth ops. Um, we growth ops also owns our trials program, you know, so we have sort of like, and oh, we own our like nurture program and re-engagement, things like that. Um, and then we also collaborate with our sales ops team. And uh, we we have a bi-weekly meeting that we call RevOps. But we're we're not currently actually in a RevOps structure. Um, you know, we report up to to different um, to different departments, marketing and sales. Um, but definitely, as we grow, so we, when I joined, we were sixty people, and now we're over two hundred, as far as I can recall. Um, and we definitely are noticing that we have greater need to be collaborating together more, um, especially around how we use Trey, right? Like we have so much automation in place in Trey across the business, but even just on the go-to-market side between marketing and sales. And so we have to collaborate on, you know, like Michelle and I are building workflows that are hitting Salesforce's API hundreds of thousands of times a day. And so we have to be careful and kind of collaborate with them on, on that because ultimately we don't own the Salesforce contract our colleagues do. So, um, so there's like greater need for more, um, more structure, a little bit more oversight, more communication. Um, and that can be difficult because we mostly were used to just kind of working on totally separate things. Um, but there's definitely value for the business when there's more collaboration, I think. So that's just the direction that we're headed in ourselves. Um, and I agree with Stephen, like there's no right answer for any business. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen an, and fortunate or unfortunate, I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I've also seen, depending on the leadership at a business, it, it's structured differently. So like, mm -hmm. if you've got leadership, who's very sales focused and a CEO who has a sales background, the odds are he's going to be investing, um, more on the sales side, in which case, operations follows the money. <laughs> so like if sales is sales has the biggest budget, you're going to have a sales ops team. Or if it's someone with more of a marketing background and the, the marketing team is a little bit more fleshed out and the budgets in the marketing side, I mean, it, you're going to have ops, um, you know, naturally be growing on the marketing side. But the important thing to take away there is operations is growing and operations is slowly becoming a more needed and needed thing at different businesses. Um, so regardless of where they plug in, it's a massive need. Um, and, and I'm seeing just the industry just blow up right now, even within the last four years. Um, I think marketing ops, um, has just exponentially been growing year over year, but specifically for these reasons, right? Because you, you've got, um, you know, GDPR, CCPA compliance, you know, all of these things kind of just being thrown at businesses it's almost impossible for them to keep up with regulations and just the way the internet and, and technology is changing without these teams and automation tools to back them up. Yeah, agreed. Um, and you're oftentimes now seeing new entrants kind of chat with the marketing ops teams like legal, um, or maybe you're dealing with like privacy issues um, more so than you have in the past, or, you know, maybe uh, there's overlap with uh, technology stacks um, from other teams like uh, HR and even finance. Um, so yeah, there's there's always going to be a role to play um, for operations teams, and I think automation um, absolutely has a big future um, in order to create create better integration uh, across the board, not necessarily exclusively with marketing ops teams. Um, so. With that, I'd like to just remind folks that now is the time to ask the panel uh, your questions. Uh, we'd love to uh, move to Q&A in a bit. Um, and uh, if you have any specific um, requests or, or follow-up items on any of the topics we've touched on today, uh, please uh, drop those in the chat box and we'll, we'll be happy to cover them next. All right. Um, so with that, let's move to the next slide, please.
We'll cover um, the first item on uh, today's agenda for Q&A. This is one that I kind of had for you guys. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious, outside of like what you'd look for, uh, which is something we already touched on, um, I'm, I'm curious, what would you like to build in the future um, to make your life easier? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll start with uh, Lauren here, because I, I know that this is a particularly interesting question for me um, here, here at Trey. So uh, what are you looking forward to building? Um, so it's sort of a broad topic, but I would say that I think the next phase for us is personalization. And uh, that could mean a lot of different things at a lot of different points in the funnel. Um, you know, so at the top of the funnel, it's like doing really smart retargeting of folks via chat or our other acquisition channels. Um, based on what we know they've done on our site already. And that's, you know, we, our acquisition strategy is very much based on the fact that we can allow customers to connect hundreds of tools with one another. And so people come to our site and they engage with the, you know, a, a page that says like integrate X and Y. Um, so how do we take that information knowing that you know, Lenny, you came to that page to integrate X and Y, how do we now market it to you in a more personalized way? Um, not just talking about those tools, X and Y, but maybe making some inferences about who you are, what, you're, what you care about, what department you're in, based on, um, you know, what you were doing on our site. So that could then be used downstream in customizing the outreach sequences, that we send out um, on our SDR's behalf. Um, we can use it in email nurture, et cetera, right? There's sort of like endless opportunity. Um, and it's kind of a, it's like a data automation challenge also. Like how do we categorize people into personas based on their behavior? Um, and, you know, for me, like focused on top of the funnel, um, top and middle of the funnel, I think the biggest impact would be in personalizing that follow-up that we send to inbound leads um, in those outreach sequences. So sending them, you know, some additional resources that are really relevant to the persona we've intuited them to be based mm -hmm. on their behavior. Here, here. I'm excited about segmentation here at Trey um, uh, and better buyer persona uh, in, uh, information for our teams to get a little bit more strategic with their with their efforts. Um, so plus one there. Um, all right. So next question uh, from the audience: What are your go-to resources for the latest and greatest automation stories, opportunities, um, et cetera, et cetera? Slack, media sources, any LinkedIn groups that you guys frequent? Stephen, maybe you can help us out here, as I know you're a you're a frequent user of the social medias. Oh. I, I'm probably biased, but I, I love Slack. I, I love one-on-one -on -one conversations. I love group conversations. I, I love back and forth. I love people pushing other people. Um, I, I, any medium that includes people interacting with other people. So there's a lot of different Slack groups I'm a part of. I mentioned the MoPros earlier. It's a great Slack group around marketing operations. Anyone wants to join, um, mopros.com. Um, and there's also a part out one and i know that there's rev ops ones out there um so like i'm a big big fan of slack and just one-on-one -on -one, even like linkedin you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily think about it there's a lot of really great conversations happening on linkedin and linkedin channels um but it, as far as content goes i mean there's some interesting youtube series um where i consume content um and then for like the nitty gritty of like how to build things, honestly, I just Google my way through it and API documentation. Um, I'm finding that the use cases that are being created within the industry are outpacing the documentation that's out there. Um, so in a lot of cases, marketing ops folks are doing things for the first time. Like they, they, they're not only solving it for the, the business for the first time, but in often cases they're doing it really just the first time ever, um, because it's a new tool, it's a new integration, it's a new API, um, it's just new. So you oftentimes just have to use maybe a different use case and just tweak it for yours. Um, 
So yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good answer to this other than any sort of collaborative environment where you can, you know, get on the phone or get on Zoom or get in a Slack channel and just have a conversation with other people um, and, and see what their take or their view is on maybe doing the same thing. Because uh, if you're in ops, you know that you can probably do the same thing four different ways. <laughs> so it's just a matter of finding the most scalable and efficient way um, of the four or a hundred different ways that you can do something. The other resource I would add on, um, similar but different, it's called mopspros.com. <laughs> if you want to join that Slack workspace, Michelle and I are in there and have often gotten questions answered. Um, and I see a lot of questions asked that automation could solve. Um, so, you know, there's also ideas for me in there. And that's a really amazing community as well. Uh, great. I uh, love it. Um, well, thanks for your feedback, guys, on that question. I love it. I love the uh, the opportunities to learn personally um, and for adding that in chat. Next up, um, we have a question around uh, rigid processes. Um, so uh, the question specifically was, we've over-engineered through the years the steps or campaigns people run through um, when they enter our database. Um, what would you recommend to prevent backlog of a daisy chain? Um, it is not solve at all. If, oh, sorry, if a, if a daisy chain is not solve all for the problem. Um, Taylor, I'd be interested if you're using Marketo, um, but uh, I would say that like, this was the issue we had when we were using Marketo. Um, and Marketo, yes. Okay, cool. Um, so our solve is a long-term one, but it was migrating to using tray workflows um, instead of Marketo campaigns. So we used to do like first to last touch attribution in Marketo when somebody you know first hits a program and then that would kick off a bunch of other stuff. We would um, you know, call some enrichment, uh, we would, God, I can't remember what else. Um, and then we would push them to Salesforce. And, you know, we had a lot of like race condition issues. Um, our database was smaller. So at Trey, I didn't experience the, the DAP backlog that you're probably talking about, but I have experienced that at other companies with, you know, 4 million record databases. Um, and so the solution for us is like each lead gets processed one at a time, not concurrently. And we go through a series of workflows that starts out with email validation, then does enrichment, then does lead to account matching and creation in Salesforce if the record doesn't exist already. Um, then we do lead scoring, then we do routing. I could be missing something here. Oh, we do attribution. So like each thing happens one at a time. Um, and that is much, has been much easier for us to orchestrate the timing of all of those processes in Trey than trying to, like in Marketo, you cannot as easily like time things. Um, like you can have the daisy chaining thing, but then you can end up with a backlog. Um, so that's been our solution. Um, I don't know how much that helps. Uh, if you want to chat more about how we're doing lead management in Trey, I'm happy to. Anytime, feel free to reach out, lauren at trey.io. And I don't know, Stephen, if you have yeah, you like know, I kinda, experience with that. I kind of want to just like get on a Zoom call and just dive dive deep into like, yeah, what, totally. like what problem you're you're trying to solve here. Um, I have a sneaky suspicion it's around like multi-touch attribution and understanding what like the first touch was versus the last touch. And then of course, all those little middle touches that are important, but people kind of forget about. Um, I, I've seen what Lauren just outlined work pretty well. Another thing I'll just add is I've also built things on the Salesforce side um, where you can just pass. So when you build like the UTM URL for paid media and all those different marketing sources, you just tack on a couple extra parameters like campaign ID and campaign member status. You pass that into the Marketo form. It gets passed in a Salesforce and you have something like a flow or a process builder that splices people out into the appropriate campaigns. 
And then now you have leads and contacts that ha can be associated with multiple campaigns. Um, I've even seen a, cu a custom object be created for all those different touch points um, along the way. So that's a lot of like solutioning without really knowing what your problem is. Um, but th I've seen that work really well too, as well as like Lauren pointed out, having something maybe sit between that just creates kind of um, an order to things and how you process things. Um, so enrichment, routing, um, data normalization, all of those, those things can happen even before it even touches your CRM. So it could sit between Marketo and Salesforce or manipulate Salesforce data after it's already passed in. But uh, I like, this is what we, these are the problems we solve as this end like every day. So now I'm just like, oh, let's get on the phone. Let's, let's like cash it out. Let's, let's map it out and figure it out. So. I just think this is like how builders work, right? Like you guys both yeah. love to solve problems. So I, I appreciate that very much. Um, all right. Well, unfortunately, we only have uh, a few more minutes left in today's webinar. Um, and we do have a few more questions to answer. We won't be able to get to everyone. But um, we have one more that I wanted to touch on from MC that I thought was a really great question. Um, the Specifically, um, have you seen any automations that help the marketing, sales, customer success teams uh, stay closer together. Uh, for example, I've heard of automations where customer feedback gets automatically tagged and put into a weekly report in order to update sales or uh, on better targeting and uh, marketing gets ideas on content, webinars, case studies, stuff like that. Um, I'm curious uh, around the customer success um, use cases that you guys have seen. Um, anything you, you can share from your past history? Uh, one thing for me comes to mind is around NPS. So um, this actually goes back to my university days uh, using NPS scores that get sent out from customer success, either negative scores marketing can leverage to just overcome objections and kind of save that deal if, if something's going south. Um, also, it can be a flag to marketing to maybe back off a little bit or maybe um, push them into a different nurture campaign that is solely focused around solving the problem that they ran into. Um, or if the NPS is really good, um, reaching out and putting them into a nurture campaign to curate, you know, reviews and um, understand what went really well and understand their needs and their use case that you can maybe leverage within marketing materials or um, map out an entire use case that you can use and promote um, for, for marketing. So I've seen a whole bunch of programs be created around NPS and partnering with customer success and making sure that not only are problems being addressed correctly on both fronts, the customer and marketing side, but then also the successes are distributed and, and used appropriately. Michelle? That was the use case I was going to touch on. We have our NPS scores now sending into a um, feedback or customer feedback channel um, that's pretty active now um, with the CS team um, and people able to start tagging one another and uh, reaching out. Um, things like that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great one. Um, I we were thinking about, I've, I've actually seen this before at my last company uh, where we did uh, reviews as an example, similar to MPS, but but maybe you're looking at third-party websites like G2 Crowd or, or Peer Insights or et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of them out there, uh, Captera and uh, alerting sales um, at the time of that uh, engagement and being able to um, make sure that the CS team sees that under the account and, and it creates like some engagement around the account to make sure that folks are stay happy, um, that are happy, or if you get a negative review that at least you're able to address it with, with the customer directly. Um, that's been one that I've, I personally have seen that I thought was pretty snazzy. Yeah, and another one might be upsell cross sell too. Like if, if someone is finishing onboarding um, with product A and the success team are basically like, right. yes, they're onboarded. They're finding a lot of success with it. Uh, then marketing can basically pick up the baton from there, reach back out to them, put them into maybe an upsell or cross sell nurture where, you know, you've finished onboarding, you're finding success. Now let's talk about maybe product B that would complement product A that you already got. So it might be more on the sales marketing side than success side, but um, that relationship when really tight can be really powerful, um, not only for the business, but also for the end user making sure that they, they get the most out of the products that they, that they purchase. There's, all right, there's all right. Oh, sorry. Go some, ahead, Lauren. Yeah, sorry. Um, we, something more, I'm not sure how much like success really gets involved in it, but, um, 
a use case that we have internally. So we use this third party vendor that interviews customers and prospects. So when we win a deal or when we lose a deal, there's, um, you know, they, they reach out to those folks and try to conduct an interview to understand like what went well, what didn't go well, et cetera. And Michelle knows this better than I do because she's done all of the building around it. But there's a whole bunch of questions that this vendor asks the customer slash prospect. And we then ingest that data. Um, I, I believe it comes into our CRM and it's also definitely going into our data warehouse. So then we've got a dashboard in our BI tool that can tell us more about, you know, in an aggregate level or at a specific you know, deal that was won or lost, like what happened and what was the feedback. Um, and that of course used to be just like a Google sheet. Um, so, you know, but now like the data is available for the business to help make better decisions. Like where should we be focusing product marketing? Um, you know, what's, where should we be focusing our sales enablement, you know, next quarter? Like wh where can we improve or what's working, right? So. Yep. Yep. I, th I think those are great examples. We've seen um, BI use cases pop up more and more as well um, in our business and folks that request um, just one-off support for, for uh, uh, in data integration side, whatever that might be. Um, great. Well, thanks folks um, for your questions. We appreciate your time on today's chat. Um, as a next step, I'd love to uh, walk you guys through a couple of resources that we find very helpful for marketing ops folks um, or rev ops folks. Uh, the first is just the state of automation report that we referenced during today's call um, at the beginning of the call. Um, you can check that out on our website. Um, also uh, on the link below that uh, our team just shared. Second, I wanted to share um, a, a specific topic that we covered at the beginning of the call on uh, the RevOps framework for, for lead management. Uh, that's a really great resource for folks across marketing ops or sales ops um, to understand how to process the full lead lifecycle. Um, and it's a lot of what we've uh, done here at Trey. Uh, so for folks that are um, new to that space or are just looking for a solution, it's a really great um, resource to help walk you through how we think about it and uh, some of the adjacent challenges. Uh, and finally, we'd love to hear how uh, we did. You can uh, either uh, follow up the, uh, uh, the chat here directly, or um, you can also uh, drop it in uh, a follow-up email that we'll be sending you and, and share uh, how you thought the fireside chat went. All right, with that, thank you so much to our lovely panelists, um, and we appreciate your, your guys' time. We'll talk to you again next time. Take care.